introduce Robert Lang. Robert is um, a full-time origami artist uh, and consultant. So uh, for those of us who think paper is, is a dead medium, he's got other ideas for us. Um, <laughs> before he became, his, his work has been shown in, in New York in the Museum of Modern Art uh, in, in Paris, at the, at the Carousel de Louvre, uh, at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, uh, in, in Japan at the Nippon Museum of Origami, among other places. Uh, but before he, he, he got into uh, doing origami full-time, he was a physicist, an engineer, an R&D manager. He has uh, authored or co-authored over 80 technical publications and has 50 patents awarded to him or pending on semiconductors, uh, semiconductor lasers, optics, and integrated optoelectronics. Robert. Thank you. Thank you. I will say if, there's, if you're ever wondering how to make a physicist feel inadequate, put him after Murray Gelman and Andrew Lankford. So I'm not going to talk about physics. I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to talk about how flapping birds are connected to space telescopes. And that sounds pretty strange, because flapping birds, that's origami, Japanese paper folding art, simple things, trivial things, birds, bunnies, cootie catchers. And it's been simple and trivial for hundreds of years in Japan. And it might have stayed simple and trivial forever, but for this man. Akira Yoshizawa, in the middle of the 20th century, took up his country's folk art and began creating new figures. But he did something even more important. He created a language for communication of origami. And as Sebastian told us, once you have language, you can do amazing things. That language was the catalyst. It let people come up with something, build upon it, teach it to someone else who could build. And this kicked off an exponential growth of this Japanese folding art. And it took origami away from those simple beginnings to someplace very different, someplace like this. Because this, too, is origami. This is one uncut sheet of paper. It's one, one of my designs from a while back. But it's got a lot of detail. It tells the correct time twice a day. And, uh, <clears throat> And there are thousands of other origami designs. So all this comes together to raise a new question. What changed? And what changed, what was the mind shift of origami, was that math came to origami. And that's what I want to tell you about. How does it enter in? Well, this is a simple origami design. It's got two folds in it, two different types of folds. One that pokes up, it's called a mountain fold, and one that pokes down, called a valley fold. And every origami figure, no matter how complicated, is nothing more than mountains and valley folds. So when you want to design an origami figure, you design this pattern, this pa crease pattern, the pattern of the folds. So how would we do that, and how would math enter in? Let me show you the equation of origami. You start with an idea, you add it to square, and you get a folded shape. And that's it. <laughs> well, no, not really. What do we mean by these symbols? And can I be? And can I be that specific? This is not just a random bug. This is a stag beetle. Can we be that specific about what we want? And the answer is, yeah, we can. So how do we do it? Let me go back to that equation, and I'm going to stretch it out. And I'm going to start from the end. If I want to end with a folded shape of a stag beetle, first I need a configuration of the paper that has a flap for the legs and a flap for the antenna, flap for the jaws. And how would I describe that configuration that I need? Well, I could draw a stick figure where every line tells me a flap and how they're connected and how long they are. And that stick figure comes from the subject. Now, if I want to go forward, that first step of drawing the stick figure, that's pretty easy. Kids do that. And that last step of bending legs to be zigzaggy and making antennas skinny, that's, that's easy too. But that middle step, that's the hard step. But that is exactly the step where math enters in, can get us over the hump and complete the creative arc. So let's look at that hard step. I've got a stick figure, and I want to make a collection of flaps. And what we do in science is when we have a hard problem, like how do you make a bunch of flaps, we look at the easiest version of that problem. And the easiest version of that problem is how do you make one flap? So let's look at that. I give you all paper, and I say, make me a flap. It's a long, skinny bit of paper. And you'll fold it in half a couple of times till it's long and skinny, and then say, that's my flap. The end of it is my flap. And if I say how much paper went into the flap, you could unfold it and look at the crease pattern, and you'd see that the upper left corner is the paper that went into the flap. And if I ask, what's the minimum amount of paper you need to do that? Well, you'd make it skinnier and skinnier. And you find the minimum amount of paper that ever goes into a flap for the skinniest possible flap is a quarter circle. So a quarter circle of paper gives you a flap. 
Now, what if that flap comes not from the corner, but from somewhere else? Well, you go through the same process, and you find it comes from a half circle or a middle circle. So no matter where a flap comes from, it needs a circular region of paper. Now we can go back to the hard problem. What do we use if we want to make a bunch of flaps? And the answer is a bunch of circles. And it seems so obvious now, but this was a revolution in the world of origami. Because once people realized to design something like an eight-legged spider, you find a packing of eight circles. That packing gave you the master plan for all of the creases that you need. That crease pattern was guaranteed to fold into a base. The base was guaranteed to fold into the thing you were after, be it a spider. And sure enough, you could make a spider. And if an eight-legged spider wasn't what you wanted, you wanted a ten ten-limbed dragonfly, you could do that, make a praying mantis, and if folding a single praying mantis from an uncut square of paper wasn't interesting enough, well, then you could do two praying mantises from a single <laughs> uncut square of paper. But not just insects. We do, oh, we could do deer, and if you want a different branching pattern, fold an elk, or, or if we have any Canadians, we do a moose. We can, we can do animals of all types, and we can put detail in to give life. So there's a dancing crane. There's one of these on display out in the hall. Or put claws on a grizzly bear or toes and eyes on a tree frog. We can do two figures from a single sheet of paper, a man with a guitar or a man with a bass. And if you think a guitar or a bass isn't an interesting enough instrument, can we do more interesting instruments? Yeah, we can. But not just representational folding. Origami has shifted to the abstract, so we can make geometrical shapes, r stars, rosettes, things that, uh, that don't look like something but that are beautiful on their own. And this aspect of origami has its roots in computer science. Ron Resch, a computer scientist and artist, developed and patented two-dimensional creases, patterns, and folds way back in the 60s, and people still fold his designs today. These are some of the things he did, and when you look at these, you think, you know, they're not just interesting and beautiful, but, but these could actually be useful, domes or building structures, other shapes. And indeed, origami and math has turned out to have applications in the real world throughout. So Koryo Miura, Japanese engineer, studied this folding pattern that opens and closed and realized this has the right properties to make a solar array. And so this folding pattern was adopted for a solar array that flew in 1995. We in the US, we make folding structures. The James Webb Space Telescope has two folds in it. You don't need an origami artist to tell you how to put two folds in, but the reason it folds is because it has to be small for the journey to fit inside a rocket, and big and flat at the destination. And whenever you have those two requirements, folding can provide a solution. Engineers at the Lawrence Livermore Lab had their eyes set on a somewhat larger telescope, ultimately a 100-meter telescope, not 100 meters long, 100-meter diameter lens. And so this would need a more complicated folding pattern. So they got in touch with me, and I worked with them, and we came up with this pattern that unfolds from, from a flat ring to a cylinder, and you can just keep scaling this by adding more and more rings and make any size telescope lens you want. And here's the first telescope lens on its test range at Livermore, five-meter lens, twice the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. But you can do more than just lenses. Japan has made solar sails that unfold as they deploy. At the very opposite end of the size scale, Caltech physicist Paul Rothman has developed techniques to fold DNA into shapes. And why would you want to fold DNA besides making smiley faces and stars? Well, to make containers for, for drugs, for drug delivery. And in the medical applications, Zhang Yu at Oxford University developed a, a heart stent, a, a tube that holds open a blocked artery that folds down using an origami pattern because it, too, has to be small for the journey and large at the destination. One of the most unusual applications came in the design of airbags. Automotive airbag designers have to make their airbags work under many conditions. Instead of crashing cars, you do simulation. But they had a problem. How do you flatten the airbag in the simulation? It turns out that the folds you need, the folding pattern, are exactly the folds and the patterns that come from those insect designs that I showed earlier. So armed with the origami algorithms, airbag designers could design their airbags, do their simulations. There's, I could go on about this. I don't have time to do that. 
so what I want to do instead is I want to leave you with a question and a thought, which is where did these applications come from? So let me look at that heart stent. That heart stent was based on what's called the water bomb base. It's the folding pattern used for that blow-up bunny I showed early on or the little blow-up box everyone makes. And the reason they could use that is because people studied the mathematics of that folding pattern. Where did that airbag flattening algorithm come from? It came because people had studied the math to design insects and figure out how to fold anything out of paper. And, and so these two examples illustrate a really powerful principle that happens in, in the arts, in the science, especially in math, that problems you solve for their own sake because they're merely interesting very often turn out down the road to have a real, live, practical application. And in the case of origami, some of those problems might even save a life. Thank you.